Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's conversation on the YouTube Creators Hub podcast. My name is Dusty Porter. As always, the host of the show, I'm joined today by Emma McAdam. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she saw the immense need for greater accessibility to mental health education and skills and started making videos for her YouTube channel in 2017. Uh, in some way, be beyond her comprehension, over 1.7 million people <laughs> now follow her and subscribe to her YouTube channel. And I believe it's actually even more than that as we are recording. And the name of her channel is Therapy in a Nutshell. I love the name of that channel. It's <laughs> clever. The branding is brilliant. Emma, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Dusty. Absolutely. So we're going to break down all the things that you've done to succeed on YouTube. But I want you to give us a full rundown of 2017 this whole thing starts. Give us the origin story of the YouTube channel and how this thing kind of came to happen. Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm going to go back a little bit further than that. So I, um, who, how far should I go? But I was working in a wilderness therapy program in 2005, six, and eight, where I was out camping and hiking in the desert with these um, troubled youth. And I saw these amazing, like transformative experiences that they had. I knew I wanted to be a therapist. I go to therapy school. Oh, I, I finished my bachelor's. I finished my master's. I go work in a treatment center for a couple of years and loved it. Like love being a therapist, love the therapy process. Fast forward to 2014. I have my first child. I um, quit for a while to raise her. And I have this this simultaneously two problems. One is that my brain won't shut up. Like I have all of these ideas and I like thinking about therapy and I love doing therapy. And then the other problem was um, so many people were like asking me questions like, oh, Emma, like what about this? Or my kid's having this problem or my marriage is having this problem. And so I thought, well, how could we make like mental health skills more accessible? What could we do to help people out? So um, as a stay at home mom, and between 5 and 7 a.m., I started making these videos that I thought, like, if I if I was actively doing therapy, this is the video I wish I could have handed to my client to say, do this for homework. So that's that's how I started. Um, and you'll, like, my first video, it's like a five-minute video, and I didn't know how to do it. Like, I wrote the video ahead of time, and I had no idea, um, like, how to turn that into a video. So I was like, do I memorize this whole thing? Like, do I, like, read a paragraph and then say a paragraph to the camera? Like, I had no idea what I was doing, so. So you had yeah. no experience in mm -hmm. content creation before the channel launched? That's right, zero. Now, my husband... Um, he has a degree in animation and so he understood, he kind of understands like filmmaking a little bit and he understood like video editing. Mm. Um, and I thought he was going to do the editing <laughs> and in the end he's like, well, Emma, here's Camtasia, figure it out. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> do you still do your own editing? Um, I don't. Uh, so in 2021, my husband quit his job to work full time for the channel and he was our editor for a year. And then we hired an assistant, um, in the Philippines to edit for a while. Now we're back to Ryan doing our editing. So nice. that's my Absolutely. That's awesome. So you're at like 1.89 million subscribers <laughs> as we record this. That's a yeah. crazy number. I mean, do you ever sit back and just think of the influence that you have <laughs> and the impact that you're having kind of just at a global level of if you were to go around and do speaking engagements, I mean, all the work that would be required. I'm sure you probably do some of that. But with your YouTube channel, you have these videos that are out there that are being viewed by hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis. Does, how does that make you feel like what are what are your thoughts on that oh my gosh it's incredibly humbling um i'm really an introvert like as i think of my work 98 percent of my work is sitting in my office on my computer like asking people questions and like writing videos like that's 90 percent of what i do um and so i'll like I, and I honestly, like I order in a lot of my food. I have four kids between the ages of nine and two. And I like, I just work at home basically. And so I'll go like, I'll fly somewhere and people in the airport every once in a while will be like, oh my gosh, you're Emma, I love your channel. It's helped me so much. Or random people will send me an email. And I just like sometimes just forget that like real people are actually benefiting from my video. And then other times I do, I see those numbers and I'm like, whoa, like how did this even happen. I would not, I'm not like, I would never ever want to be famous. I would never want to be a celebrity. Like, I feel like that would be the worst job ever. <laughs> and somehow, <laughs> like I'm neither, I'm, I'm not a celebrity, but this idea of like so many people watching me, I kind of try not to think about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's probably better that way. Uh, you know, my channel doesn't do near the numbers that yours does, but it gets around mm -hmm. fifty to sixty thousand views every day. And even the thoughts of just that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that fills up a lot of arenas around the United States. And so, just uh -huh. the thought of just kind of the impact that YouTube allows us to have. Now, you took your your knowledge and education and you applied it to the channel so you talk a lot about anxiety you talk a lot about just the different things and benefits of therapy and it's basically like an online therapy session sometimes with some of your videos right with the topics yeah. that you're that you're covering how yeah. has your channel evolved since 2017 until now like what has been kind of some of the bigger evolutions and pivots that you've had to make yeah i mean it Initially, I was just kind of making one-off videos, and I would say, like, in 2017, so I worked on my channel for three years, 2017, 2018, 2019, and I was getting um, around, at the end of 2019, I was getting around 20,000 views per month. Um, we were making 15 bucks a month or something on the channel, mm -hmm. and at that point, um, we had just had our third kid. And so fitting this into the cracks wasn't working anymore. I learned about SEO in the fall of 2019. I'm like, oh, SEO is a thing? That seems important. I went back and redid the SEO on all my videos. And um, in, in the spring of 2020, like January of 2020, my husband was trying to work a full-time job. I was raising three kids at home and we were kind of splitting at the seams. And I thought, man, we have to quit. Like, I can't keep making these videos. It's too hard. Like, I, I would get really wrapped up in them. I get very excited about my, mm -hmm. my videos. And I was very passionate. And I had a hard time not thinking about them all the time. And so um, I was like, I've just got to quit. I've got to quit. And um, to be honest, like, for me, I'm a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a Christian. And I just, I prayed. And I felt like a very strong, like, feeling that I needed to just go one more month. So... Um, February of 2020, all of a sudden the world changed a little bit and March of 2020, between February and March of 2020, I had two videos go viral. I had um, a video on how to break the anxiety cycle go viral and I had a video on how to stop catastrophizing go viral. And in that moment, I realized both of them got over a million views in a month. And that was like, what? <laughs> what just happened? And I mean, part of that was SEO. And part of that was just like the timing with the world and everything going on. Um, and in that moment, I was like, okay, like, I think people need this. I think like right now in the world, people need a place to go and um, learn w some skills. So I kept yeah. going. And, and by the end of that year, we were making enough money that by the next year, my husband was able to quit his job and we could focus on it. The power of what we can do on YouTube sometimes goes kind of undiscussed. People don't talk about just the ability to freely upload a, a video on a topic or uh, whatever you're doing. And it's just second nature to us now. But if we really sit back and realize the power and platform that it allows us to have, uh, it's somewhat scary, but very, yeah. very exciting. And you yeah. mentioned that you get passionate about mm -hmm. the topics and get wrapped up in them. I think that's how you know you've selected the right niche or the right space to go in is yeah. that you can just talk nonstop uh, all the time and you never run out of topics. And, and mm -hmm. we'll certainly touch on that uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you a question about, you mentioned search engine optimization and mm -hmm. you optimized it for your channel. What were the things that you did? What did you go back? What did you learn and the things that have had and moved the needle the most for the channel? Yeah, I mean, so the foundational things, which I did not even understand, was like including a long description with descriptive terms, using more specific terms, um, like especially specific questions people ask, um, you know, like the basics of, of SEO, search engine optimization for YouTube includes... Um, uh, and some of this has changed in four years. Like, I think SEO is less important when you have an audience than before. And there are types of videos that are search type videos. And there are types of videos that are subscriber type videos. And there are types of videos that are like clickbait type videos. <laughs> and um, I would say like the, like my videos show up, like, how do I, okay, let me back this up a little bit. Let me back this up a little bit. The most important thing to get found is to know your audience, to know them well, to know what their problem is and what they need, and to provide an answer or a solution or even just a handle on that problem, something they can grab onto and start thinking about things in a new way, in a way that 
from my perspective, fits their need. So my videos in general, like the way I make videos is different than other people make videos, but my videos are usually under 15 minutes and I write them and I spend 10 to 20 hours writing a single video so that it's concise, impactful, and has a storyline so that people can basically be like, oh, I'm having a problem with blaming myself all the time. Here's a video on why you think it's all your fault. And Emma explains why your brain has this weird, like default shortcut to blaming yourself. And that helped me see myself a little differently. So then I have a tool to actually change how I act on that. So more important than like using all the, the SEO little dinky do's that you can do is understanding your audience, knowing what their problem is and helping solve their problem. So are you starting <laughs> with the problem? Are uh -huh. you, when, when you start a video idea, you have a video topic, do you kind mm -hmm. of break it down in, okay, here's the problem that my target audience is going to have for this video. And then you break it down as to bulleted points or however you script it out. Can you discuss mm -hmm. kind of maybe how you flesh that out once you have the problem? Yeah, and I could, I could even pop up a video template if you wanted to see, but I have a template I use when I write a video, and it's, it starts with a working title, which always changes, and then it goes to problem. That's the next thing I write, and the problem is, so like one of the last videos I just wrote that's actually going to publish today is like, oh, you feel anxious, but you don't know why. And people often don't even realize like where their anxiety is coming from. They don't realize maybe that they're doing this this cognitive process that's contributing to their anxiety or they have these micro habits that are contributing to their anxiety. So that's the problem. Then my next thing on my template is the solution. And, and this is just like the metadata on my video. It usually takes up about half a page of my script. And it's just mm -hmm. like me making sure I'm hitting these points. So if you looked at my video template before I can publish a video, I force myself to fill this out. And sometimes like sometimes these videos come in kind of a rush, like, oh, I have this great idea. Let's just type as fast as I can and I'll fill this all out. And then I go back and look at the metadata on the video. Um, but usually when I write a video, I start with a working title, I start with a problem, and I start with a solution so that I'm really clear on what my audience is gonna get from this video. And and you could use all the cool, and, and then like as part of my metadata, there is a section for like, what's the thumbnail gonna look like? What are the keywords gonna be? What's the visual interest in the video? Um, am I gonna do an audience poll? Am I gonna do a promotion? Am I gonna do a call to action? So those are like the main like checklist items I, I make sure to have in a video, but, um, before I worry about keywords, I make sure that I'm solving a problem for someone or I helping them, helping them and find it. You solution. mentioned your template and we can certainly mm -hmm. link that in the show notes. So once we get done here, yeah. you might can send that to me via email when you have a chance. But I do want to mention what tool are you using? Is it Google Docs? Google Docs. Or, yeah. yeah. So you Google just have Docs. like a running Google Doc. And do you script out these videos completely? Are they bulleted? Um, mm -hmm. I, I do believe that one of the unsung heroes or one of the most undervalued skill sets for a creator is their ability to write. Mm -hmm. I am trying to become a better writer. You think, oh, well, you make videos, you record podcasts. Why would you need to be a good writer? Mm -hmm. I feel like the creators, and I've interviewed over 450 people on just this podcast, just creators alone, and the ones that are above the bar, the ones that are not just, oh, they're pretty good, but these are great. I mean, they're fantastic. Are the people who can write well, the people who can take their thoughts, put it on paper. So are you scripting these? Or are you bulleting these? Maybe give us the whole process I of kind of what you're doing. Yeah. So if you were to look, um, oh, how far do you want me to zoom out? Let me dive in. You like deep answers, right? Okay. Yes. So I, I use ClickUp for my project management. Um, I have a running list where you change the status of ideas. I currently have 150 ideas on my brainstorm list. So every time I have an idea that I think is potential or I read an article or something, I slap it into my brainstorm storm list and, and link whatever interesting thing is there. Then I, I, as I shift to ideas that I think, okay, this is the one I wanna work on, I move them into my next up for production list. And that usually, right now it has 10 to 15 ideas in it. And then I take three or four of those ideas at a time and I write them and I write them out word for word and I use a teleprompter. I use the app Prompt Smart Pro. I use a little $150 teleprompter. Before I had any money from my channel, I made myself a teleprompter using an eight by 10 piece of glass and some foam board. So a $2 teleprompter and then an iPad running Prompt Smart Pro. I write my scripts out word for word. I spend 10 to 20 hours on a five to eight minute script. Sometimes my scripts are 
15 minutes. Um, and I review them multiple times. I get them as concise and clean as possible. Now that I have a little bit bigger production, I'm working with an editor who, um, she's someone from my neighborhood, but she's like been writing a novel for five years. Like she's just a good writer and she reviews my scripts every once in a while. Um, I met a, I hired a punch up writer from Fiverr. Um, and now I just work with her on the side. Don't tell Fiverr, but, um, <laughs> but she, uh, she helps like add in some like funny stuff because sometimes I get too serious. And um, so what is I'm, a punch up? What is a punch mm -hmm. up writer? Yeah, a punch up writer pops in and writes jokes into your videos. They make okay. your videos. They make your scripts more interesting. Oh, that's that's fun. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So she. So I write a script out. And then I say, Ariel, come check out my script. She comes in, she puts in 20 jokes. I keep like five or 10 of them. And it just makes my video slightly more interesting. I don't use her on every video. There's certainly some videos where it's like not appropriate, but um, other videos where I can make them more interesting. She helps me like bring in some energy basically. Yeah. I feel like that people do it so many different ways. I find that when I've tried to script out my videos or podcast intros before, it becomes very stilted. That's uh -huh. just me personally. Uh, yep. Me as a performer, I was always into acting and theater growing up, and I loved that kind of thing. And so I feel like it takes away my ability to express emotion when I'm reading off of a script. But mm -hmm. I've watched a lot of your videos, and yours don't feel that way. It feels like you are actually telling a story, and you're doing a really good job of taking what you've written down and translating that into into video um, and I guess that's just the power of practice and just you doing it over and over again well and I've tried to like I've worked with a bunch of other therapists this is the weird thing like I think what I do is just like oh this is like anyone could do what I do but I've, I've tried to work with a bunch of other therapists to have them build courses or make YouTube videos and my process doesn't work for them <laughs> um, like like some of them are really dynamic like talking like engaging in a dialogue um, and some of them are really good just off the cuff but um, for me and my process, like I'm a very fast reader. And so after I've written this script and reviewed it 20 times, I know it really well and I can read it in a pretty natural way. But yeah, I think yeah. for a lot of people that doesn't work. And like, if you compare me to other mental health content creators, I can tell you what they do. Like Tracy Marks uses a teleprompter. Uh, Patrick Tehan uses bullet points and healthy gamer GG. Like he's just really dynamic in how he presents. And he's, he uses a lot of, um, energetic language and a, a little bit more extreme language than I use. I actually really like his content. I respect him. I'm not even going to refer to any therapist who I don't respect on YouTube, <laughs> but um, they all use kind of a different process. But this is the process that for me, I think makes my videos work. And, like and my videos, like admittedly, my videos are less entertaining. I would say they're, they lean much more toward education. And um, I kind of own that. I'm like, yeah, this is a boring video. That's going to teach you a mental health skill. And I kind of go there. <laughs> It's like anything on YouTube, whether it be the tools that you use, the camera you use, the software you use, it's really what works best for you, right? Yeah. The, the, the things that you have in your tool belt need to be the things that complement your skill sets and what you do. And for you, it's scripting. And for yeah. me, it's just a bulleted list of here's some bullets and, and talking points that I want to go over and talk about, and I'll do cuts in between. So it really just depends on the strategy that you want to take. Now, you've mentioned a couple of times that your husband was able to quit his job and is now doing the channel with you full time. So you're obviously making some money doing this. So let's talk about monetization. I want to break this down into a couple of questions. First, can you just break down the different, I like to call them monetization buckets that mm -hmm. you're able to make money with through the channel and your brand? Yeah. Yep. So um, YouTube partner program accounts for at this point, I think about 25% of our revenue. Um, I work with one sponsor, BetterHelp. They probably account for 15% of our revenue and um, our course sales, uh, which we've shifted to a membership. We do memberships and one-off courses is probably 60% of our revenue. And then there's a little bit coming from Patreon, like under $1,000 a month and a, probably similar amount for merch sales. So okay. like and so a few percent. If you don't mind me asking, on like an average month, don't tell me exactly, but like mm -hmm. on an average month, what, what could your channel or brand make? And, and obviously the YouTube channel kind of being the hub of that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, our, like, so our, I consider our YouTube as being the top of the funnel, but if you count the whole brand, mm -hmm. we're looking at maybe $50,000 a month. Um, yeah. And we have three or four part-time employees, contractors, and then me and my husband. 
Right. And then with the YouTube channel being top of funnel, you mentioned courses, merchandise, membership, the partner program. How many views on average would you say like every day or month? Do you know off top mm -hmm. of hand kind of what your channel gets on like a daily basis or a monthly basis? Yeah, we do. We do um, about 2.4 million views. So it's interesting. Ours is very seasonal. Um, so in the summer, people are a little bit like happier. So they <laughs> engage with my channel less than in January. Um, but like in the summer, like 2.4 million views on the YouTube channel, about 100,000 downloads a month on the um, podcast. On the podcast, yeah. So you're in you you release one podcast episode per week, and you're also uploading those to the channel as video podcasts. Correct? We haven't even talked about that. Yeah. So um, I actually am incredibly lazy about the podcast. This might make you cringe, but I um, <laughs> I I literally just take my YouTube video, cut the audio, slap in a different intro, and put it on the podcast. Like, okay, I, all right. And then every once in a while, I'll do a long form interview with um, someone, an expert in some topic, and I'll include like the longer version on the podcast, like a 40, 45 minute version on the podcast and like the YouTube podcast um, stream um, where I might do a shorter cut for my main YouTube channel. Hmm. Okay, I love that. Hey, I'm not a I'm not against <laughs> repurposing content, right? Like sure. I'm I'm always changing my and always evolving how I do my systems. For the yeah. longest time, I only did audio, and I was yeah. a YouTube podcast. So that uh -huh. just tells you, like, <laughs> I was big into podcasting. I consumed audio podcasts every time I walk, every time I do things around the house. Yeah. I have my AirPod in, uh, doing things, and you know, so I'm listening to podcasts. And so I'm a big fan of that. And I've just now transitioned in the past two years into video because people ask for it. They wanted the video, and now yeah. I've changed from moving from Zoom. Now I'm using Riverside and I love the quality that Riverside gives me. And I really want to amp up kind of my video side of my podcasting thing. And so the channel's doing really well right now. Uh, and so it, it it's all about you being able to pivot and evolve. It's the thing that I always mention. The next topic I want to ask you about is artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. your thoughts on that, how you're using it for your mm -hmm. brand and your channel. But people who are against a new technology per se, mm -hmm are the ones that are gonna get left behind. And the same goes for a YouTube channel. If you're seeing trends on YouTube and within your channel analytics and you're not willing to make the move and you're not willing to lean into it, um, it's kind of like people who are fans of college football. I'm not sure if you are. Here in the South, we are huge college sure, football yeah. fans, big Georgia Bulldog fans. We played Clemson at the first uh, game of the year a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about the Clemson coach not evolving, not moving into what mm -hmm. they use the transfer portal now and bring in kids used to. You had to go to a school, commit to a school, and you had a penalty if you moved. Now you don't, and yeah. the coach at Clemson is not willing to go in that. So he's kind of old school, and it's hurting his team's performance. And the same goes for YouTube is that you will hurt your channels performance and ability to grow if you're not willing to evolve so talk about ai and te that technology and how if at all you're implementing it within your channel yep so i am much more old school i am slow to adopt new technologies but fortunately <laughs> my husband is really into that stuff um, so he's he's been very passionate about AI. He studied it for the last two years and actively used it. So we're using AI in more ways than I would have guessed. So uh, the the first way is I mean clearly we're using um, AI for subtitles in different languages. We just dubbed most of our videos in Spanish um, using AI, and um, every once in a while we'll use AI for a thumbnail. It's not my favorite. Um, I have used AI to help me write sometimes. Um, there's some topics, like AI does good when it's like um, a topic that's really well known. So I just wrote a video on um, the way that cortisol, which is a stress hormone, impacts obesity and diabetes. And that's all related to this um, groundbreaking study. This is like kind of technical, but I'm gonna go there because I get excited about this. Um, it's, it's all related to this groundbreaking study called the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. So I was like really curious about cortisol and insulin and diabetes and obesity. And so I wrote this video and I realized I needed to give like a background video about the ACEs study, which is this kind of historical study on how childhood trauma impacts your health, your physical health for the rest of your life. And um, that's a video that AI is really good at writing because the ACEs study is like a concrete piece of facts. It's not like 
oh, let me, like, let me give you some deep piece of, like, why your brain does this. It's like, here's the story of the ACEs study. And so um, AI wrote much of that video for me, and then I went in and kind of made it better. <laughs> yeah, that's what um, you have to do with AI. You have yeah, to use you can't it as supplemental, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I love that. So I assume you're using, like, ChatGPT or Gemini yep. or Claude or one of those? Yeah, right now, ChatGPT. And... Yeah. Um, Let's see. The other thing that I found really interesting. So I, so I work 15 hours a week. That's it. I work three hours a day. Um, so I have very limited hours and that is one of the reasons why like we aren't really capitalizing on our podcast. Like we just don't have the hours to do that, but I film one day a month. This is my filming day. Hello. Um, and, um, if I miss something, in the video when it goes to editing and they're like, Emma, you didn't do a segue to the promotion or you didn't even do the promotion or you had zero call to action in this video. Ryan has cloned my voice on AI and he'll pop in like a, a minute voiceover from AI and it sounds nice. like me. So that's like probably my favorite thing because it prevents me from having to go record again on a non-recording day if we wanna keep our production moving. So I want to take a step back and dive into what you just spoke about. You work three hours a day, 15 hours a week. You're a yep. busy mom. You got four kids under the age of 10, I believe, or 11, as you yeah. said. Yeah, nine and is so my oldest. Yeah. You have a ton of stuff going on, but you're still able to succeed at a very high level on YouTube. Mention kind of how that has changed over time. You're now batch recording mm -hmm. one day a month mm -hmm. and the power of that and the freedom that it gives you. Yeah, I think I, I feel incredibly fortunate, incredibly blessed that I'm able to do this. And, um, you know, this is the only source of income for our family. Like we're incredibly, incredibly fortunate. But I have to be super clear, like 80-20 rule, right? Like 20% of the tasks are the most important. Mm -hmm. And um, with as a creator, every creator out there who's listening knows that there are 200 opportunities right now they could be taking advantage of. You could be making more shorts, you could be making cooler shorts, you could be working with different sponsors, you could be doing more podcasts, you could be doing TikToks, Instagrams, Twitters, live, uh, like, mm -hmm. what's that work one? <laughs> yeah. uh, LinkedIn, there we go. LinkedIn. You could be doing all these different places and you, like, I feel incredibly strongly that I must choose and be intentional about prioritizing the most important, most impactful aspect of my work, and that is writing good YouTube videos. So 80% of my time goes to writing good YouTube videos, three hours a month, less than three hours a month. I film those videos, and then I've tried to hire out or let go of everything else. If you realize, like you have, that YouTube is the top of your funnel, then nothing else matters than the content you produce, right? You can get sucked into all of these things and all of these distractions, whether it be tools, new tools, new technology, we just talked about AI, but at the end of the day, if when you, or if when Emma hops into her Google document, if what she's mm -hmm. writing is not good or quality, then nothing falls from that funnel. Nobody's buying a course, nobody's buying merch, nobody's becoming a member. Mm -hmm. Everything falls from that. And you have to know and understand your business well and your brand. And I want to kind of uh, conclude this interview talking to you a bit about packaging. Um, I love the name Therapy in a Nutshell. Your branding mm -hmm. is so spot on. Um, just to do a little bit of descriptive audio here, uh, the logo for her channel is, is kind of like a, 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 a nut, right? Like a, a, a nut and then one side is the actual exterior of the, 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 the thing and then the other half is the brain as if the nut's kind of half cracked and the, the brain, I, I highly recommend you and encourage you to go check it out <laughs> if you haven't already. So the yeah. branding and packaging is important. And when I say packaging, I mean everything from your channel banner, your channel profile image, the name of your channel, and then going down even deeper, thumbnails, titles, descriptions. How important is packaging for you and what you're doing? Oh man, I think it's, I think it is really important and that, that we know, I mean, the visual brand is important. The brand expression is important. And we worked hard on that both right when we started the channel 2017, when we had very few resources. And then again, when we kind of really dove into the channel in 2021. Now, um, I am not like an appearance oriented person. So I often forget about 
forget about that brand expression. But one thing that I do consistently know is like what my brand identity is, which is I make educational videos. I do not like if you if you pay attention to a lot of health creators, they are making a lot of clickbaity videos like these doctors who used to make really good educational videos are now talking about like what someone got stuck in their butt at the ER because that's what like <laughs> that's yeah. what like sells. Right. That's and what gets clicks. Yeah. Yeah, so I like I've been very intentional about my brand identity, which is I make educational videos based on research that help clients that a therapist would be proud to recommend mm -hmm. um, and that that use a growth mindset. Like I actually believe change is possible and we don't need to settle for like our lowest <laughs> possible potential. So as much as my brand expression is there with the cute little nut, which I love, my husband drew that. Um, I drew the original sketch in church one day, a very long church day, but <laughs> he, he made that graphic and I love it. Um, but I know, I know what I'm about and I make sure when I make a video that that's what I'm about. With the thumbnail creation process, I assume you outsource that as well. Like, who's who's doing that? What my tools sister. are they using? Oh, your sister! It's a whole family business. Yeah, my sister does my thumbnails on Canva, but we do we are pretty intentional about them, and I try to plan them ahead of time. Um, that's another case where I use AI. Like yesterday, I was I was on ChatGPT has Dolly, and I was like trying to make a visual of getting unstuck from your thoughts, and so me and Dolly had a long conversation, and then it it made some ideas for me. So that's another way we use AI. I love that. Emma, you have been an amazing guest and you've built up this just awesome platform where you can help people in their mental health. And I think it would be a disservice for me not to ask you this question as we close out. Um, a lot of the creators I work with, with coaching and things like that, are dealing with burnout. They're mm. dealing with a lot of high anxiety because a lot of these people don't and cannot do YouTube full time yet. And yeah. so with that being the case, they're dealing with all these mental things of uh, trying to get YouTube videos done and do it the right way with quality, as well as have good relationships and good home life and, and, and do well at their other full time jobs. So what can be some advice that you give about time management and managing your the, the stress and the workload? Yeah, such a good question. So, um, and full disclosure, this last year, I was super burnt out. Like from January to July, I was just super burnt out. And I took the month of August off, which I'm grateful I have the freedom to do that. Um, and I had to let go of publishing every week. So I did publish every single week from 2021 to 2024. Um, and I finally missed a day or two this year. <laughs> um, and, and I think burnout's um, very real. Uh, for me, I, I just read three books on this that I, I would recommend, kind of. Uh, I just read Burnout by Emily Nagoski. I really liked her first chapter. The middle six chapters, I was kind of like, eh. And then the last two chapters were great. Um, and she teaches about closing the stress cycle. So having time to turn on your YouTube brain and turn off your YouTube brain, I think is important. The next book I read was Cal Newport's uh, Slow Productivity. Yes, and that, I've read, I love that book. I love that I, book. I can't I stop talking about yeah. it. Yeah. His podcast is mm -hmm. something I just got into called mm -hmm. Deep Work, I believe is yeah. the name of the podcast. I'll mm -hmm. link it in the show notes, but yeah, go ahead, continue. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I'm excited you're excited about it because reading his, bo reading his book, he has three main principles and one is do less stuff, one is work um, at a natural pace, and one is obsess over quality. And his idea is like just do like do less stuff, you feel, the reason you feel like you have to do so much stuff is not because you have to do so much stuff. It's because you're anxious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's true. That's accurate. And you look mm -hmm. at some of these great creators. Like if you look at Mark Rober, he could publish a video every day with the money he's making. He could build up a production machine. And instead he chooses to publish one video every month. And it's really yeah. high quality. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I really took away from Cal Newport's book was work in seasons or work at your natural pace, which might not look like working every single day. So for me to prevent burnout in the future, here's what I'm gonna try is I'm gonna work seasonally with the school, with the school schedule. So I'm gonna produce as many videos as I can while the kids are in, in school. And then when they're out of school, I'm going to take it off and I'm going to hopefully have some in the queue for next summer and everything. But, um, yeah. I, I think, I think for me to like maintain my sustainable approach <laughs> to YouTube, I've got to like stop sprinting so much. So those sure. are kind of my, my main takeaways. 
That's powerful. Um, again, uh, this has been Emma McAdam from the Therapy in a Nutshell YouTube channel. I'll try to have as much of the stuff we discussed in the show notes of this episode as well as a free course that Emma provides. Those and, and the ways to contact her will be in the description of the show. Emma, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and your recording day to uh, join us today. Thanks so much for having me, Dusty. It's been fun.